Hi, I'm Roz Naylor. I direct the Center on Food Security and the Environment at Stanford University. And I'm here for the beginning symposium of the Food and Nutrition Security Series. And I have Ron Hardy here, professor and director of the Aquaculture Research Institute at University of Idaho. And Ron, uh, we are so lucky to have you here. First of all, I wanted to thank you for your efforts. And well, thanks. Uh, to the audience, Ron has uh, been in aquaculture for uh, many years and is really considered to be the father of uh, fish and aquaculture nutrition and one of the leading experts in the world on aquaculture. So we're really lucky to have you here. But I want a little perspective on the history here. Um, how did you get into the field of aquaculture to begin with? Well, I did not wake up one day and say, gee, I want to be the best fish nutritionist in the world. <laughs> it evolved a little bit. I began as a, uh, in my career as a um, pre-med student and studied zoology. I worked in medical school for a little while because I thought that was going to be my career choice. And um, I didn't really like it that much. Uh, I mean, I liked it, but I didn't like it. So I was I'd taken a lot of biochemistry, cell biology, other types of zoology courses, and I ended up moving to a program studying biochemical nutrition. And my focus was going to be on humans, but I was always also interested in exotic animals, uh, zoo animals, dogs, cats, that kind of stuff. While I was studying that, I went to the library one day and came across a book called Fish Nutrition by a guy named John Halver, who, to correct the, correct the record here, He's the father of fish <laughs> nutrition. I'm his son. <laughs> anyway, so this book was published, and no one had ever taken it out. You know, what, what's fish nutrition? So I, I took that book, went home and read it. Came, I thought about it a little bit. I thought, this is where I belong for two reasons. It's really interesting. I realized that someday fish were going to be a major food source and a major contributor to food security in the world. And we weren't there yet. And secondly, I looked at it, and this sounds a little arrogant, but as a someone who'd studied nutrition, I thought, this is a gold mine. <laughs> <laughs> There's so much we don't know about fish. There's hundreds of species compared to pigs and chickens. And there's a lot of work that can be done. And uh, the application of, of some of the uh, knowledge that I gained studying nutrition of other animals and, and humans, it just seemed to fit really well and, and, and provide a, a pathway to uh, you know, to really make advancements in fish nutrition. Yeah, that's that's a great story. And you were at the University of Washington originally, and a lot yes. of the salmon aquaculture, I think, started there, didn't it? It did. And um, so as a specialist, particularly in salmon and trout nutrition, um, one of the issues that always comes up is on feeds. And what do these animals feed mm -hmm. on? Are they actually consuming more fish than are being produced in mm -hmm. the process? I know this field's changed a lot. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the most exciting either tools that you've used to understand the best nutrition and some of the best alternatives that are out there now? Well, that's, that's a good question. Sometime in the 90s, it kind of dawned on us all of a sudden as aquaculture, particularly salmon and trout, um, mainly salmon, really started to grow, that we were, we were really going to face a problem because we depended so much on fish meal to provide fish meal protein uh, in these diets. They're carnivores. That's what they ate in nature. But it, we looked in the future and said, someday this is going to be an issue if it grows at the rate it's growing. And then you came along <laughs> <laughs> and pointed this out to the greater world, not just our little fish world. And that, I think that was really a catalyst for a lot of people to jump on, the, on this topic and, and really look in more detail. Um, and, and maybe um, accelerate the, the rate of change and, and the urgency. So. Um, getting back to where we're going to go with it, obviously we, fish, well let me back up and say, I, we realized after a while that fish had really, using fish meal, had really papered over our lack of knowledge. Fish, are, fish meal is a very complex material and it's got a lot of nutrients but also other biologically active components that are missing in plant meals and other protein sources. So as we would make these substitutions, problems would arise with the fish, with their health, with their growth, with their feed efficiency, and so on. And so it took a lot of effort over many decades, really, to start to tease out these elements one at a time and see 
what do we need to supplement? How do we need to change the formulations? How do we need to process the ingredients differently for these fish? They've never seen these ingredients in, in, uh, in their evolution. So I kind of lost the track of, of where so your the, question the was. the tools but, but that you get to understand um, what the best nutritional quality is, how, what do you do in your lab? I mean, how do you actually decide to really go down one avenue in terms of fish nutrition What you know that might be promising or could be a total failure? What, what, what how do, we, do you approach problems? What do we do? We, uh, we started out doing what we call feed them and weigh them studies. <laughs> <laughs> So we'd make diets in which we'd take out fish meal, put in other ingredients, feed them for a period of time, and see what happened. Um, and then add supplements and see if we could overcome those. But that kind of, uh, you know, like empirical, cut and paste type studies only could take us so far. We really need to dig deeper and look at um, some of the biochemical changes in the fish, some of the uh, met metabolic changes in the fish that might be associated with a particular ingredient. And most recently, which has been, been a revolution really, has been <clears throat> looking deeper at gene expression and how nutrition, um, nutritional changes in the diet not just affect a particular um, pathway or a particular nutrient, but, but have a more of a global impact on the fish, its health, uh, its immune response, its, its reproductive capacity, and so on and so forth. And this goes back to for 150 years, to be honest with you. And what that, <clears throat> in the first study of human nutrition, the focus was on curing diseases. So there was a disease called beriberi that was associated with, with, uh, with uh, polished rice being fed in Asia. And that was discovered to be a deficiency of thiamine, which was peeled off when the rice was polished. So the symptoms of beriberi were cured by adding thiamine. Yeah. Similarly, vitamin D, that's a classic case with rickets in, in, in children. So we had this idea, and we're only shedding it in the last 10 years, and it is one, di one nutrient, one disease. What's happened now with genomics is by looking more globally at the gene expression of various tissues and cells, we see that these nutrients have effects throughout metabolism. We just didn't notice them because we would notice the first clinical symptom that would arise but there's much more going on. And I think that's really changed our outlook on how to approach these problems. But it also, it's interesting, because it's from your initial interest in human health and nutrition and then nutrition of other organisms, you've come, come full circle, but did yeah, yeah, really dug have. much deeper into the science. And uh, one of the, actually, most fun uh, projects or papers I ever worked on was the one on feed alternatives with you because I just learned so much, the group of people that you brought together and all of the trade-offs that go on. You know, you think you have, uh, you're solving one problem and then consumers don't like the fact there may be a genetically modified expression in the canola oil you're using exactly. or they might not like the fact that chicken fat is used in feeds. That's right. Um, are we, you know, what are the biggest challenges that you're seeing in terms of, you know, really being able to get over the fish meal, fish oil barrier? Is it is it consumer preferences? Is it regulation? Or is it just the pure science that, that well, it's, unintended consequences? It's maybe all of the above. Uh, it depends on where you are in the world. Of course, in Europe, GMO ingredients are banned in fish feeds. Uh, certain land animal proteins have been banned for a long time because of the BSE problem. Whereas in the, in the United States, we don't have those restrictions, and neither do they do in China. So that's been an issue in some markets. There are some that predict that in 20 years, no one's going to care. Uh, we have to feed the world, and, and, and maybe that, that, that concern will be diminished. Um, I think the biggest challenge, though, has been associated with the fact that plant proteins are really different. Plants play defense. Plants don't want animals to eat their seeds <laughs> or eat their products, <laughs> and, 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 and they, they want to reproduce. So they've evolved in many different plants and seeds and so on. They've evolved these mechanisms to either make the, the material taste bad, to affect their metabolism through affecting their thyroid, for example, or their digestive capacity. And we didn't really understand a lot of that. And we've, we've now kind of worked out how some of these... Um, anti-nutrients that are present in feed, in, in feed ingredients from plant origin are seeds and basically oil seeds and grains. 
how they work, and how sometimes they work together when you put them together. So they may work one way when they're tested independently when you put them together. Sometimes there's other additional interactions that we, we didn't know. Um, so anyways, that's really been a challenge. But huge breakthroughs here in yes. our understanding this yes. stuff. Was there ever uh, sort of one experiment you did or one country you worked in or one nutritional product where you just said, I just nailed that. That was such a success, and it's just a great indication of where we're yeah, heading. Really, this really. Field. <laughs> 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 or is it just more incremental? I mean, it just is so complex. So, um, and and people like to simplify this field in ways I don't think it's necessarily realistic because it's a complicated field. Well, yes and no. I mean, a lot of the things that, you, that, that we've worked on are incremental, and one thing leads to another, and we go down blind alleys, and then we back up and say, "Gee, we should go this way." But I did studies back in the 80s um, looking at the effects of substituting different um, fatty acid or different oil sources for fish oil because we knew fish oil was going to be a limiting ingredient too. And we did the first study ever in salmon in which we looked at the effects of feeding these oils on the fatty acid composition of the fish and then realize those implications as far as the human health aspects and the omega the value changing the changing the amount of omega threes and therefore possibly changing the potential health benefits to humans immediate yeah. that's been a challenge yeah but we didn't even really think about that to be honest with you they all grew fine <laughs> <laughs> and then we looked we looked at the tissues and said, oh my gosh we've made a big change that's just been a big bit in the news lately. You maybe have seen. Yeah, it, I have seen seen that. <laughs> seen that. And this, uh, you know, is 20 years later. But uh, that's led to a whole field of inquiry to to explore other alternatives and to f come up with strategies where we can uh, feed these alternative oils for a, a period of the grow out cycle and then try to enhance the dietary level at the end to boost up the omega threes. But it's not easy. Yeah. It's also, though, stimulated a lot of research into developing other sources of omega-3s that are not from fish oil. All the omega-3s in the world come from algae. Yeah, so, this is so, you know, somewhere along the line, <coughs> algae have to be incorporated in this. And so now there are companies who are developing algae-based products, often for human use, for medicinal use for humans. But there are byproducts of this that we think have a lot of potential. Right now, the economics are not quite where they... Um, they they should they could be I guess, but it, but the trends definitely are such that the the prices of these these products and fish oil will converge, and I think that's got a lot of potential. I think so too. It sounds great. So um, so there's a lot of students in the audience and at Stanford that are really interested in going in the aquaculture field. Yes. Given <laughs> given given all your experience, uh, you know what would you advise them? What what would you? It's a gold mine. Okay. <laughs> It is a gold mine, actually. I and mean, I don't think people are going to be eating wild fish, you know, no. 20, 20 years from now. No, they, well, I mean, they will be, but they're not going to certainly be the major portion yeah. of the food supply. And um, <clears throat> the interesting thing about fish nutrition, uh, when I started, it seems it's basically, like I said earlier, a feed them and weigh them study. But, but if you look at fish nutrition, it's, it, you have to understand so much else about the physiology of the animal, its life history, we don't just, and then the other challenge is we don't feed one species, like pigs and chickens. They're really not that different. In aquaculture, we're feeding hundreds of species. They have different life uh, histories. They have different digestive capacities and different reproductive strategies. And <coughs> all of these things factor into their uh, ability to, uh, different levels of domestication, too. That's another big deal, which I'll talk about in my seminar. So uh, you can't simply be a nutritional biochemist and, and, and be able to solve these problems. You have to really broaden your knowledge base, and, and I think that's a really fun thing. I think, just, I think so, too. Absolutely. You're, not, Absolutely. You know, you're in a narrow channel, but uh, if you're going to be effective, you really have to have a much more broad education and, and, and bring so many other factors into bear. That's a great note to end on at Stanford especially. So thanks so much for coming. Thank you. <laughs> thanks for inviting me.